This is Daryl Cherney, and I would like to offer my tribute to Mark Drake in the wake of his passing. I was actually rather shocked to hear of his passing. I didn't know he was sick. We sort of lost touch after he moved to Fortuna, which was a bit of a surprise to me because I know how much he loved the more rural area and also his solitude that... Uh, the Leggett area, the Leggett metropolitan area, gave him. So let me offer you this. Mark was an extremely kind and compassionate person. I'm not sure where to begin. I could say that he was always there to help me fix my vehicles. And this is important because I was, still am an activist, but back then I was in the heyday of Earth First activism. Every $10 donation, every $5 donation, every $25 donation was treasured. And so to have somebody offering to repair your car for free, usually paying for the parts, was uh, extremely valuable. And as much as it was valuable, it was also heartening. Heartening to know there was somebody there that uh, was there to take care of us. And not only that, but I had a Dodge. And so he specialized in Chrysler products. And even though mine was a Dodge van, it was still a Dodge. So Mark was very um, helpful in terms of helping me find parts, uh, possibly even an engine for my old Dodge van, which was the horse I rode in, him, in on, by the way, back in 1985 when I arrived here, the Dodge Sportsman with a camper shell. He um, it was fascinating to Mark to watch Mark work on vehicles because it was just right there in the middle of kind of nowhere, and he had his shop set up. It was almost like you could eat off the floor. It was so organized. He was so knowledgeable. Then we get into just his actual donations, monetary donations to Earth First, and the work that I and Judy Barry uh, were working on the protection of Headwaters Forest the protection of forest in general, because Judy also worked on smaller forests. She called them the baby redwoods, which in a way was just as important because the old growth had the, the soil underneath it and all the um, mycorrhizal fungi and all the other um, nutrients that were necessary. But the young trees, once you cut a second or third time, the soil is just robbed of all of its nutrients and we wind up with what we call desertification. So regardless of whether we were working on old growth or new growth, Mark was there to contribute $1,000 here, $1,000 there, multiple times, especially when you needed it. You know, we were ourselves not uh, overbearing when it came to requesting donations, but whenever we really, really needed something in a hurry, Mark was there with a grand. And yet we live in a world where the people we're fighting have millions of dollars at their disposal, at their disposals, and ride on yachts and have multiple houses and mansions, and and here we are, you know, scrambling for a hundred here, five dollars there, a thousand dollars in a really big day. And Mark was our benefactor. He was there um, to just support us when we needed it the most. Now he was also not just a mechanic; he was also knowledgeable. On electronics and I know that he helped Judy Barry with her uh, her new cabin after Judy was bombed after Judy and I were bombed uh, Judy was in the process actually while at the time of the bombing she was changing dwellings she was moving from the place that she co-owned with her ex-husband in Redwood Valley and she was moving to Willits actually to String Creek Road and it was at that time that she was bombed now Judy was a carpenter so she was no slouch when it came to building things herself, but she'd been crippled badly. Mark was there to help her finish the construction of the shell of a cabin that she was moving into. She had an agreement to move into a shell that she would fix up in exchange for free rent. And so now since she was bombed, she couldn't do all the work that she had planned on doing. And Mark was there to lend a hand, whether it was setting up her solar panels or anything else, Mark was there to just help Judy. I really think that Mark had a little crush on Judy, but not, you know, not in any kind of 
you know, bad way. He was just very fond of her and cared for her deeply. And he asked nothing in return. Um, so there you are with, you know, one of the best activists that I've ever met in the history of activism. And there's Mark helping her after she uh, suffered severe life altering injuries. Uh, and then, you know, there was the, the time that uh, we took the FBI to trial. Now, the story is that Judy and I were um, organizing Redwood Summer. We were the, pri the principal organizers. And we were uh, receiving a lot of death threats. Mark, of course, was very concerned about this, uh, as he was always very compassionate human being. But uh, Judy and I decided to hit the road, kind of get away from Dodge. And to make a long story short, we were on our way from Oakland to Santa Cruz when a bomb blew up underneath the front seat of Judy Barry's car. Uh, to, the, to add insult to injury, or injury to injury, the FBI and the Oakland police arrested us instantaneously, pretty much within the first five minutes of the bomb going off, saying that it was our bomb and that we had bombed ourselves. Well, Judy was in the hospital for six weeks. And then, um, as I mentioned, when she finally got out of the hospital and out of her safe house, Mark was there to help her rebuild. But then we sued the FBI and the Oakland police for falsely arresting us and for violating our First Amendment rights, that they had blamed us for bombing ourselves, not because they thought we were guilty. They knew we were innocent, but because they were trying to silence our freedom of expression, which is a violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution. The government cannot act against you for exercising your free speech. Well, Judy died of cancer in 1997 before we were able to get to trial with the FBI and the Oakland police. But when the time came to go to trial, we needed not just, uh, we, needed to, we needed to show the car that Judy Barry and I were bombed in, this bombed out shell of a 1981 Subaru that should have been evidence that the FBI was holding on to or the Oakland police, but instead they just left it out in the rain and then they just gave it back to us in a hurry. So we had to scramble to get it into a barn and cover it up. And there it sat for basically 12 years, the shell of a car. Well, Mark was always there to help move the car from one barn to another barn because sometimes people will give you a hand and store the car for you, but then they want their barn back. And then it came time to go to trial. We had two vehicles, a running 1981 Subaru that I had acquired, that I drove down to Oakland, and then we had the bombed out shell that we had to get on top of a flatbed trailer and drive down to Oakland. And this is where Mark, once again, was the hero. Because let me tell you, moving a bomb car is not so easy. And he procured the flatbed, he made sure it was secure in the flatbed, and then we drove it down to, uh, then he drove it down to Oakland, California where we were going to show it, where we did show it, to an actual jury. And here's a little funny story. It's not so much a Mark story, but it is a story. And actually, I have video of Mark um, at this particular event. And that is that um, I alone went to the parking lot where we were going to show the bomb car. You have to bring the jury downstairs from the courtroom with the judge herself, in plain clothes, no less, about two blocks away to a public parking lot. And the day before I had paid um, to reserve like four or five or six parking spots because we needed to have not just a parking spot for the bomb car and a parking spot for what the car would have looked like the before picture, before it was bombed, which the car I had brought. But we also needed room around it for the jury uh, to walk around the car and see the before and after pictures and how a bomb could have been put in the car by looking at the, uh, the before picture. Well, the, park, the parking lot attendant was kind of surprised they needed to reserve six parking spots. And then I gave him a $50 tip. And I said, please make sure this happens because we have a, a jury coming here tomorrow. And the parking lot attendant said to me, you don't need to give me $50. And I looked at him and said, yes, I do. Excuse me. Sorry about that. So yes, I 
said to the parking lot attendant, yes, I do need to give you $50. Well, the next day, at, toward the end of the day of the trial, uh, the trial day, it was a six-week trial and a three-week jury deliberation, we all went down to, to uh, see the car, the jury, the judge, the, the uh, spectators, including Mark, who, of course, was one of the people. Actually, he had to bring the car that day to the parking lot to where the parking attendant who got the $50 tip was about to figure out why he needed the $50 tip. And um, and so there they were, the jury, looking around, walking around the car. And all of a sudden, toward the end of this whole day of looking at the car, not the whole day, but the, the hour or so, this kind of crazy guy with a skateboard just walks up to the car out of nowhere because we weren't just the jury and the judge. There was all kinds of people walking by going like, what's going on? Well, look at that. There's a bomb car and there's a judge and a jury. And there's a, it was a scene. And that's when I gave the guy 50 bucks. But toward the end of the day, this guy shows up with a skateboard, a random dude. I don't know what his deal was. And he starts banging on the car with a skateboard. Bam, 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 bam. It's like, what are you doing? Like, it didn't seem to have any rhyme or reason to it. And I know that Mark and also John McCowan were there to, like, stop that guy from damaging the evidence. It was really just, you know, the, the older I get, the more I just see things that you just can't explain. And there is no explanation for it. But, um, and then, of course, Mark... Um, and John McCowan, who later became a supervisor of Mendocino County, went ahead and got the car out of there. And that was that. So um, I could go on about Mark, but I think the thing that I really want to say about Mark, in conclusion, is that he was a conscience. He was an intellect that you could bounce your ideas off of. He was a guide. He was a funder. He was a safety net. He made it so that this very dangerous world of activism was just a bit safer for us to travel in, to be active in, because that's how he saw his role. And there aren't that many people who are like that. And so I want to thank Mark for all of the work he's done. I know he also worked in his own causes. He you know, worked at KMUD and he worked for Civil Liberties Monitoring Project. Um, but I want to thank Mark for everything that he did for us. I've lived in a world where I've seen a number of people pass that I didn't get to say goodbye to. Mark was one of them. I, I didn't even know he was sick. So I'll take this opportunity to say goodbye, Mark. Thank you for everything you were you're a dear soul. You're a friend. I'm sorry that Fortuna put this big divide between us and I didn't get to hang out with you in the end. I did call you once or twice, but I didn't get to see you again. And I'm for that, I'm sorry. But I'm not sorry for having met you and having been graced by your presence and assisted by your presence. So thank you, Mark Drake, and to Mark's family, my condolences, and also so great of you to have such an honorable man, a wonderful human being as a member of your family. Blessings.